I got rid of those damn mango cigars and got, got some better ones. Slightly better. An upgrade. Grenadiers. <laughs> so, at least I'm not stuck with those. Uh, we're continuing in The Decline of the West. We're on the chapter in Volume 1 called Destiny and Causality. And... Uh, uh, Roger Mull is, I do want to mention him again, I mentioned him yesterday, uh, I think it's pronounced Roger, it has the I-E, um, sent uh, that chart to me in the back of Frutzeiter Weltgeschichte, um, the dawn of world history, he sent the, the chart, and he is going to proceed to read through all of Spengler's uh, Nachlass, and uh, the other book that Spengler was working on was called Urfragen, which I think means something like primordial questions, or basic questions. Um, it's a metaphysical book that he also never finished. And then another book is coming out that he wrote that's a collection of notes, uh, I Am No Prophet. Um, so that's coming out. Um, and uh, Roger is going to read through all this stuff, including a, a biography on Spangler, and keep reporting details back to me so we can learn more about these untranslated writings. Okay, so... Page 138, subsection 7, Spengler resumes, The ordinary everyday man <clears throat> in all cultures only observes so much of the physiognomy of becoming, his own and that of the living world around him, as is in the foreground and immediately tangible. The sum of his experiences, inner and outer, fills the course of his day merely as a series of facts. Only the outstanding man feels behind the commonplace unities of the history stirred surface, a deep logic of becoming. Thin logic manifesting itself in the idea, uh, or this logic, <laughs> sorry, uh, having a rough time getting going here today. Uh, this logic manifesting itself in the idea of destiny leads him to regard the less significant collocations of the day and the surface as mere incidents. At first sight, however, there seems to be only a difference of degree in the connotations of destiny and incident. One feels that it is more or less of an incident when Goethe goes to Sessenheim, but destiny when he goes to Weimar. Um, Thomas Mann wrote a novel about his love affair with a woman named Lotta, um, and it's called Lotta in Weimar. Um, he wrote it, uh, he has Schopenhauer's sister in there uh, as a character, and Goethe shows up at a dinner party near the end, and he's quite a disappointment. Uh, <laughs> when we finally meet the great Goethe in that novel and he shows up at this dinner party, as I, as I recall, I read it back in college, um, he's kind of shitty. Uh, people don't really like him all that much. Um, so it's pretty funny, actually. Uh, one regards the former as an episode and the latter as an epoch, but we can see at once that the distinction depends on the inward quality of the man who is impressed. To the mass, the whole life of Goethe may appear as a sequence of anecdotal incidents. While well, very few will become conscious, with astonishment, of a symbolic necessity inherent even in its most trivial occurrences, perhaps then the discovery of the heliocentric system by Aristarchus was an unmeaning incident for the classical culture, but its supposed rediscovery by Copernicus a destiny for the Faustian? I mean, I would think so. Uh, Aristarchus put forth the heliocentric cosmology, Aristarchus of Samos, I think during the Hellenistic period, and it was just simply deleted. It was edited out. It's like, no, no, we're not doing the infinity thing in this culture. Everything has to revolve comfortably and very cozily around the earth. Um, was it a destiny that Luther was not a great organizer and Calvin was? And if so, for whom was it a destiny? For Protestantism as a living unit, for the German, or for Western mankind generally? Were Tiberius Gracchus and Sulla incidents, and Caesar a destiny? Questions like these far transcend the domain of the understanding that operates through concepts. What is destiny? What incident? The spiritual experiences of the individual soul and of the culture soul decide. Acquired knowledge, scientific insight, definition are all powerless. Nay more, the very attempt to grasp them epistemologically defeats its own object, for without this in, the inward certainty that destiny is something entirely intractable to critical thought, we cannot perceive the world of becoming at all. Cognition, judgment, and the establishment of causal connections within the known, i.e. between things, properties, and positions that have been distinguished, are one and the same, and he who approaches history in the spirit of judgment will only find data. 
But that, be it providence or fate, which moves in the depths of present happening, or of represented past happening, is lived, and only lived, and lived with that same overwhelming and unspeakable certainty that genuine tragedy awakens in the uncritical spectator. Destiny and incident form an opposition in which the soul is ceaselessly trying to clothe something, which consists only of feeling and living and intuition, and can only be made plain in the most subjective religious and artistic creations of those men who are called to divination. To evoke this root feeling of living existence, which endows the picture of history with its meaning and content, I know of no better way, for name is mere noise and smoke, than to quote again those stanzas of Goethe, which I have placed at the head of this book to mark its fundamental intention. In the endless self-appearing flows forevermore the same, Myriad arches, springing, meeting, hold at rest the mighty frame. Streams from all things love of living, grandest star and humblest clod. All the straining, all the striving, is eternal peace in God. On the surface of history, it is the unforeseen that reigns. Every individual event, decision, and personality is stamped with its hallmark. No one foreknew the storm of Islam at the coming of Mohammed, nor foresaw Napoleon in the fall of Robespierre. The coming of great men, their doings, their fortune, are all incalculables. No one knows whether a development that is setting in powerfully will accomplish its course in a straight line like that of the Roman patrician order, or will go down in doom like that of the Hohenstaufen or the Maya culture. And, science notwithstanding, it is just the same with the destinies of every single species of beast and plant within Earth history, and beyond even this, with the destiny of the Earth itself and all the solar systems and Milky Ways, the insignificant Augustus made an epoch, and the great Tiberius passed away ineffective. Thus, too, with the fortunes of artists, artworks and art forms, dogmas and cults, theories and discoveries, that in the world of becoming, one element merely succumbed to destiny when, when another became, and often enough has continued and will continue to be, a destiny itself, that one vanishes with the wave train of the surface while the other makes this, is something that is not to be explained by any why and wherefore, and yet is of inward necessity. And this is the phrase that Augustine, in a deep moment, used of time as valid also of destiny. If no one questions me, I know. If I would explain to a questioner, I know no. So also the supreme ethical expression of incident and destiny is found in the Western Christian's idea of grace. The grace obtained through the sacrificial death of Jesus of being made free to will. The polarity of disposition, or original sin, and grace, a polarity which must ever be a projection of feeling of the emotional life, and not a precision of learned reasoning, embraces the existence of every truly significant man of this culture. It is even for Protestants, even for atheists, hidden though it may be behind a scientific notion of evolution, which in reality is its direct descendant, the foundation of every confession and every autobiography, and it is just its absence from the constitution of classical man, that makes confession by word or thought impossible to him. It is the final meaning of Rembrandt's self-portraits and of music from Bach to Beethoven. We may choose to call that something which correlates the life courses of all Western men, disposition, providence, or inner evolution, but it remains inaccessible to thought. Free will is an inward certitude, but whatever one may will or do, that which actually ensues upon and issues from the resolution, abrupt, surprising, unforeseeable, subserves a deeper necessity, and for the eye that sweeps over the picture of the distant past, visibly conforms to a major order. And when the destiny of that which was willed has been fulfillment, we are fain to call the inscrutable grace. What did Innocent III, Luther, Loyola, Calvin, Jansen, Rousseau, and Marx will? And what came of the things that they willed in the stream of Western history? Was it grace or fate? Here all rationalistic dissection ends in nonsense. The predestination doctrine of Calvin and Pascal, who both of them more upright than Luther and Thomas Aquinas, dared to draw the causal conclusion from Augustinian dialectic, is the necessary absurdity to which the pursuit of these secrets by the reason leads. They lost the destiny logic of the world becoming, and found themselves in the causal logic of, of notion and law. They left the realm of direct intuitive vision for that of a mechanical system of objects. The fearful soul conflicts of Pascal were the strivings of a man, at once intensely spiritual, and a born mathematician, who was determined to subject the last and gravest problems of the soul, both to the intuitions of a grand instinctive faith, and to the abstract precision of a no less grand mathematical plan. 
In this wise, the destiny idea, in the language of religion, God's providence, is brought within the schematic form of the causality principle, i.e., the Kantian form of mind activity, productive imagination, for that is what predestination signifies, notwithstanding that thereby grace, the causation-free uh, living grace, which can only be experienced as an inward certainty, is made to appear as a nature force that is bound by irrevocable law and to turn the religious world picture into a rigid and gloomy system of machinery. And yet was it not a destiny again, for the world as well as for themselves, that the English Puritans, who were filled with this conviction, were ruined, not through any passive self-surrender, but through their hearty and vigorous certainty that their will was the will of God. <clears throat> Um, so now he's going to get, begin to get into some of the literary, back to the tragedy and the figures of tragedy. <clears throat> so uh, another one of my favorite sections, subsection 8 here. We can proceed to the further elucidation of the incidental or casual without running the risk of considering it as an exception or a breach in the causal continuity of nature. For nature is not the world picture in which destiny is operative. Wherever the sight emancipates itself from the sensible become, spiritualizes itself into vision, penetrates through the enveloping world, and lets prime phenomena, instead of mere objects, work upon it. We have the grand, historical, transnatural, supernatural outlook, the outlook of Dante and Wolfram. I presume that's Wolfram von Eschenbach, the author of Parzival. And also the outlook of Goethe in old age that is most clearly manifested in the finale of Faust Part Two. If we linger in contemplation in this world of destiny and incident, it will very likely seem to us incidental that the episode of world history should have played itself out in this or that uh, phase of one particular star amongst the millions of solar systems. Incidental that it should be men, peculiar animal-like creatures inhabiting the crust of this star that present the spectacle of knowledge and, moreover, present it in just this form, or in just that form, according to the very different versions of Aristotle, Kant, and others, incidental that, as the counterpole of this knowing, there should have arisen just these codes of natural law, each supposedly eternal and universally valid, and each evoking a supposedly general and common picture of nature. The physics quite rightly banishes incidentals from its field of view, but it is incidental again that physics itself it should occur in the alluvial period of the Earth's crust, uniquely as a particular kind of intellectual composition. The world of incident is the world of once actual facts that longingly or anxiously we live forward to as future, that raises or depress us as the living present, and that we contemplate with joy or with grief as past. The world of causes and effects is the world of the constantly possible, of the timeless truths which we know by dissection and distinction. The latter only are scientifically attainable. They are indeed identical with science. He who is blind to this other, to the world as the divine comedy, or drama for a god, can only find a senseless turmoil of incidents, and here we use the word in its most trivial sense, so it has been with Kant and most other systematists of thought. But the professional and inartistic sort of historical research, too, with its collecting and arranging of mere data, amounts for all its ingenuity to little more than the giving of a, of a cachet to the banal incidental. Only the insight that can penetrate into the metaphysical is capable of experiencing in data symbols of that which happened, and so of elevating an incident into a destiny. And he who is to himself a destiny, like Napoleon, does not need this insight, since between himself as a fact and the other facts, there is a harmony of metaphysical rhythm, which gives his decisions their dreamlike certainty. It is this insight that constitutes the singularity and the power of Shakespeare. Hitherto, neither our research nor our speculation has hit upon this in him, that he is the dramatist of the incidental. And yet this incidental is the very heart of Western tragedy, which is a true copy of the Western history idea, and with it uh, gives the clue to that which we understand in the world, so misconstrued by Kant, time. It is incidental that the political situation of Hamlet, the murder of the king, and the succession question impinge upon just that character that Hamlet is, or take Othello. It is incidental that the man at whom Iago, the commonplace rogue that one could pick up in any street, 
aims his blow is one whose person possesses just this holy special physiognomy. And Lear, could anything be more incidental and therefore more natural than the conjunction of this commanding dignity with these fateful passions and the inheritance of them by the daughters? No one has even today realized all the significance of the fact that Shakespeare took his stories as he found them and in the very finding of them filled them with the force of inward necessity and never more sublimely so than in the case of the Roman dramas, for the will to understand him has squandered itself in desperate efforts to bring in a moral causality, a therefore, a connection of guilt and expiation, but all this is neither correct nor incorrect. These are words that belong to the world as nature, and imply that something causal is being judged, but superficial, shallow, that is in contrast to the poet's deep subjectivizing of the mere fact anecdote. Only one who feels this is able to admire the grand naivete of the entrances of Lear and Macbeth. Now, Hebel is the exact opposite. He destroys the depth of the anecdote by a system of cause and effect. The arbitrary and abstract character of his plots, which everyone feels instinctively, comes from the fact that the causal scheme of his spiritual conflicts is in contradiction with the historically mo motived world feeling and the quite other logic proper to that feeling. These people do not live. They prove something by coming on. One feels the presence of a great understanding, not that of a deep life. Instead of the incident, we get a problem. So Hebel is writing, I think, in the early 19th century. I've never read Hebel. Um, I don't think a lot of him has been translated, um, but he's one of the first um, dramatists who come on stage who's a problem man. He starts thinking in terms of civilizational terms as everything is a problem to be solved, not a destiny to be felt and lived. <laughs> Further, the Western species of the incidental is entirely alien to the classical world feeling, and therefore to its drama. Antigone has no incidental character to affect her fortunes in any way. What happened to Oedipus, unlike the fate of Lear, might just as well have happened to anyone else. This is the classical destiny, the fatum, which is common to all mankind, which affects the body, and in no wise depends upon incidents of personality. And so he hasn't said this yet, but each civilization has its own destiny idea, and the great destiny idea for the classical world, uh, the Greco-Roman world, was Moira. And Moira means uh, a kind of physical boundary that surrounds you, and if you transgress it, you're in trouble. Moira is cosmic. It's implicit in the cosmos, and even Zeus is subject to it. But what happens to you in Greek tragedy, uh, he's saying here, um, has nothing to do with the character of the individual, as in Faustian tragedy, it has nothing to do with the character. Oedipus was just a dude who stumbled into a bad situation. That the same thing could have happened to anyone. It doesn't matter. What matters is that it happens to his body, physically. Fate is felt as a physical thing in the classical civilization. In the Magian Arabian civilization, fate becomes kismet. Kismet comes directly from God. Uh, Job is the primary text. He says Job is the only text the Magian civilization produced that actually comes close to the feeling of, a, of great tragedy. Um, fate comes from God, and it's directed like a lightning bolt directly at Job, who simply has to suffer God's will. Uh, and isn't it said all, always in Islam, Inshallah, uh, it's God's will. Uh, let, God, let Allah's will be done. Um, it's always Allah's will. Everything that happens is Allah's will. Um, and then in the Northern European Faustian civilization, destiny is weird, W-Y-R-D. It's later respelled as W-E-R-D, as in the Weird Sisters of Macbeth, uh, that becomes in German, Verden, to become. And the destiny idea means that a man's character is his fate. Destiny comes from within. It doesn't come from an external god or a cosmic source. It comes from who you are as an individual. Um, and that is actually probably the closest to the actuality of the ontology of the way things really are. Uh, if you believe in reincarnation as I do, then you come into this world with a fate, already equipped with inside of you that simply unrolls like a scroll as your life unfolds. So each of these civilizations has a different destiny idea. In India, it's uh, karma, where your destiny is predetermined. Uh, not, not all of it, but much of what happens to you is predetermined by karma, and so forth. The kind of history that is commonly written must, even if it does not lose itself in co a compilation of data, come to a halt 
before the superficially incidental, that is the destiny of its authors who spiritually remain more or less in the rock. In their eyes, nature and history